Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good, good. Oh, yeah, I always start my uh, presentations that way. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking to you about data visualization in practice. And so what's on the agenda? A, a quick introduction to data visualization. Some of the five data visualization principles that I sort of believe in and uh, believe that everybody who's interested in doing any type of data visualization should be following. There's a little bit of an echo. Okay. Sorry about that. how successful data visualizations are designed. I'm going to have one uh, case study as well, and I'll show you a startup in Montreal that's doing some really cool stuff around social media and how they're visualizing that for their clients. And uh, just lastly, some, a few tips and, and some of the mistakes that I've learned with D3.js. So this is a, a bit of an intermediate to advanced talk. Uh, I'm assuming that you guys have heard at least of D3.js. Um, am I right in that assumption? Raise your hand if you are. OK, sweet, awesome. Um, and then uh, maybe at least a basic understanding of statistics. Is that, is that also uh, a thing? Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about me. My name is Remy. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist in Montreal. So I actually flew in here last night. Um, and uh, my job really consists of hanging out with developers, talking about the latest technologies, seeing how Microsoft can help them uh, in, their in their startups, their uh, jobs, their companies, whatever it is. And I hang out a lot in the Notman House, uh, which is an incubator as well as a co-working space for startups and developers uh, in Montreal. And there's a lot of tech events that take place over there as well. Uh, so if anything, I, I, I really love coding, shipping, and then just doing that all over again. So if you've ever got any questions about anything Microsoft related or whatever, uh, let me know. Um, I'm on Twitter. That's the best way to reach me, actually. And um, yeah, just uh, tweet at me anytime that you want. All right, so I guess the first thing that we should start this presentation with is what is data visualization? Now, data visualization is difficult to define for a lot of people. And everyone seems to have their own definitions of what it is, um, what are its best practices, what should be done, how it should be done. So to keep it simple, I like to define it like so. Data visualization helps people understand data through visual display. Sort of sounds obvious, right? It's like basically saying what those two words mean. Um, and that's how I like to define it, because it, it really is a mixture of different things. But more importantly, I think you have to define data visualization in the context of where you're doing, where you're doing it, and uh, what you're doing it for. So why do we do data visualization, I think, is a much more relevant question. And um, it really descends to two main objectives communicating knowledge clearly and efficiently, and displaying data to understand cause and effect. These are, I believe, the two primary objectives of data visualization. Now, it seems as though when you're accomplishing one, you're also accomplishing the other. So they're not mutually exclusive objectives, but they, they can be um, sort of split in that way. Um, and in essence, most of the time, when you accomplish one, you've also accomplished the other. But if you look at that definition, You'll notice that one of it is a, one side of it is a little bit more um, about the human condition, and the other one is a little bit more scientific. So in essence, data visualization is both an art and a science. Um, you have to have an understanding of sort of the human condition, how people communicate, how people uh, understand, how people receive knowledge. So that's a little bit more of the artist side of it. You have to be able to communicate. That's that's why I think it's more. Sometimes it's an art, but at the same time, it, it is a science. And um, the science behind it and your connection with statistics is extremely important. And I'll show you what happens when you start to mess around with your visualization to, for it to be a little bit more artistic, and you actually end up losing the entire value of the visualization, which was to communicate a, a knowledge uh, that you gained and a truth as opposed to just showing something that's aesthetically pleasing. But of course, everybody likes seeing pretty visualizations. Um, so this one is an interactive map of all the taxi routes in New York City. It looks pretty nice, but apparently the screen resolution is not too good. Um, but hopefully the next one will be a little bit prettier. Who watches soccer here? OK, awesome. This is the World Cup and the, <laughs> the tweets that were happening. So the, the volume of tweets as it progressed. And you can see how different. 
uh, countries, the activity on Twitter uh, changed depending on who they were playing against. And you know, some countries had a little bit more activity um, on Twitter than some others, so the comparison's a little different. But it looks really nice. And then here's another one that I like a lot. Um, this one shows sort of block by block the age of the buildings in Brooklyn. So it's pretty nice. It looks a little bit like impressionist art. And, um, but it, it still it actually communicates something of extreme value. You can see some neighborhoods have much older buildings than others, and then some neighborhoods are a lot newer. Um, those are the ones that are sort of more uh, newer developments that are just happening now. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. This one is by uh, the, the uh, Brooklyner Project, B-K-L-Y-N-R. So Brooklyn without vowels, pretty much. I like this one as well. Um, this was more modernist, I guess. Straight lines everywhere, but that's because it's LA. Right? Everybody loves driving cars in LA. So you can notice here, this is the quality of the pavement on the roads. So um, if you look at closer to the beach, that's Santa Monica Beach, you'll see more red. I guess sand maybe has something to do with that, or just traffic, because <laughs> everybody <laughs> wants to go to the beach. And in other more residential neighborhoods, you'll see it's more green. So in essence, it's both an art and a science. You can create something that's actually really beautiful, but at the same time extremely valuable in terms of the knowledge that you're communicating uh, through the visualization. And that really is what data visualization is about. Now, of course, no presentation on data visualization can go without a slide of Edward Tufte. Uh, he's sort of the father, um, and uh, he, he has this awesome image, which I found on the internet, which was great. Uh, and uh, <laughs> next to it is actually a graph in one of his famous books about the march that Napoleon did and how um, different casualties took place depending on where the troops went and how the troops were split. It was pretty cool. Now, the other interesting thing is what is not data visualization? Um, so the purpose of visualization is insights, not pictures. That's a quote from Ben Schneiderman. And um, in other words, it's not really about aesthetics. And if that's what you think data visualization is about, well, I have some really awesome tweet that maybe you guys should tweet um, right now, and it's this. Data visualization is not about creating infographics for your marketing department. Now, obviously, for any presentation to do well on Twitter, I feel like I have to tell you what to tweet. So this one is like packaged, you know, you got the hashtags there, the right ones. You can even quote me there. Um, so I dare you to tweet that. Uh, your marketing department might not like it, but I don't care. Now, why should you care? You're probably wondering, like, why should I care about all this stuff? It seems like it's very niche, and um, I don't know, unless you have a passion for data, you tend to seem to not really care about data visualization. Um, and, well, here's the reason. Besides that I'm going to show you how to add real-time data visualizations to your front-end web apps and share some of the principles you need to create effective data visualizations, here's why you should really care and listen up and tweet. And I said that really fast just to get your attention again in case you were dozing off. This is the reason why big data. With every photo, uh, tweet, purchase, GPS movement, data is being created. And today, if you look at the whole amount of bytes that are being sent out there, about 85% of that data is automatically generated by sensors and devices. So this data that's being generated right now and that we basically don't have control over, the minute we sell something, it's sort of gone. Um, and it's just generating all this data that we could get back and use. And, and that's, I think, why data visualization is extremely crucial to understanding all this big data that's being generated by services, by apps, by devices that are out there. Now, of course, I just bashed infographics, but I, f I feel like I have to show you an infographic, right? Uh, so here's a little one. If you want to check it out, just take a picture of that link and, and go visit it. I'll post these slides up afterwards. Uh, but essentially, big data and the universe. This is something that our, um, a little bit cut off on the screen, but it's an um, infographic from our uh, work, Microsoft for Work uh, department. And it really shows you um, the amount of data is being produced, as well as an interesting statistic that I think is really relevant for everyone who's here, and that is that 1.9 million jobs in 2015 will have to do with some type of data analytics. Um, and that's really crucial. So if you're a developer, uh, I mean, last I heard, recruiters were offering $150,000 starting salaries for data scientists. 
so if you're interested in data and have any little semblance of passion, it could be a very profitable field for you to go into. Um, which brings me to this other thing, what is data science and data scientists, right? Like, uh, we went from data visualization to big data and now to this new term. And essentially, it's this new term that sort of popped up recently to describe folks who extract knowledge from big data or from data using scientific means. Essentially, you're basically taking big data and making data visualizations out of it, trying to capture knowledge that's in the data. That's who you are as a data scientist. Now, I mentioned a few tools that have come out. Uh, this is what they look like. There's so many big data tools out there. These are just the open source ones. There's more like being done by um, uh, for-profit uh, groups, obviously, and uh, among them Microsoft. So if you're interested in big data on Azure in the cloud, we do have HD Insight, which is a really cool tool. Now, this brings us back, I guess, to the topic of today, why am I here? And that is, how do we do big data visualization in practice with D3JS. Now, there's the way that I like to approach just any type of data visualization is uh, talk is to just really talk about the principles first, why we do how we do things before we just dive into D3. Because I feel like a lot of folks, especially with how popular D3 has become, there's a lot of people who are just trying to do data visualization based off any data and are basically misleading themselves with what they're learning as opposed to actually doing things on principle. Um, so let's start with that. Let's start with sort of some of the five best uh, practices and principles for big data visualization. And principle one is context is king. The context in which data is visually placed impacts the knowledge that can be gleaned and communicated. That's something that you can tweet as well. <laughs> Um, so l let me explain this a little bit more by example. And then the example that I'm going to use is from Mike Bostock. He's the founder of D3, actually, and he used to work at the New York Times. And uh, they had an article about stop and frisk, which is this uh, policing tactic in New York City. Now, the report data came from the city, so it was composed with, of like location data, um, time, and a few other variables as well. Now, if you look at this and you're trying to figure out what's happening with, with stop and frisk in New York, well, the way that you would approach it first is perhaps, hey, let's see what's happening with the amount of stop and frisk that's going on, right? So perhaps we could actually visualize it as this little graph. Hey, look, it seems to spike around the earlier part of the year, so during the winter, I, I guess, I don't know. Uh, it seems like New York, uh, basically New York's, New Year's, New Year's Eve uh, is a very popular point, right, for people to be out. <laughs> of the, their houses and therefore more likely to have stop and frisk uh, type stuff happen to them. But you'll notice towards the end it seems to be on declined. Um, now, this is actually just a very simple graph. Anyone can do this, but it doesn't really provide us with too much information, too much knowledge that we can glean from this visualization. Perhaps we should actually change the context that this data is placed in, as opposed to just taking a look at what's happening with the data per day, like how many stop and frisk stuff are happening per day, why don't we put them where they actually are? So here's what Mike Bostock did. He actually put them on uh, a map of the city of New York. So you'll notice that there's, in some places, a lot more of these occurrences than in others. And um, in fact, if we just put all of this data on a map, we're still not really getting as much information as we'd like we're actually losing temporal information, aka when these things happened, right? So it's not just enough to just change the context of how you, how you visualize your data, but you have to sort of think about it in, in different ways. And that brings me up to this, my other point is that a lot of times you actually want to show things in comparison, so data in comparison. And um, to do this while still keeping the sort of space aspect, this, this spatial context that we put our data in, well, how can we do that? Well, there's different ways. You can maybe have arrows that show movement, so how much declines and, and whatnot, but that's really not going to give you much information right off the glance because it's going to be really messy and as much as you'd like to zoom in, perhaps you, then it will be useful. But in fact, it's almost always um, better to take the simpler approach, which is just to show two maps side by side, right? And in this case, here we have data visualization first half of 2012, on the other side, the last half of 2013. So although the New York, so the, the actual main point that um, the article was trying to make is that 
the New York City police has been claiming that in a lot of places, stop and frisk, they're not, they're not doing it overall. But in fact, if you look at some of the pockets in the city, they're still the, the same amount of stop and frisk. So in other words, has it really disappeared or not? It's, it, the data doesn't seem to, uh, seem to show that it's disappeared everywhere, but in fact, it's sort of disappeared only in a few places, or things are no longer being reported, which is also a possibility. Now going back to this whole idea that context is king, um, the data that, that, that was there is also multivariate. There's different variables as well. So how do you also show those variables in the same type of context to get information as well? Well, one of the variables that they also had was the race of the people that were being stopped. Um, so what you can do is actually just show these in multiple different colors. So here in this case, they had, um, I don't remember the exact uh, legend for the colors, but you can see that in different pockets of the city, there's more of one type of color versus another. So it's, it's interesting, and in that that's also context. Uh, sorry, that's also information that we can take by changing the context where the data is placed in. Now, of course, you can change uh, the information that you're getting, but just by changing where you, where you place that data, how you place it. But in essence, you can also miscommunicate things by doing that as well. Um, so <laughs> this is uh, an example of The Guardian, which is a UK newspaper, uh, publishing this chart showing a US poverty map. Now, one of the uh, data scientists at the New York Times, Gregor Aish, he also took offense at this uh, graph because he found some inconsistencies. Um, so although context can help you and it can also lead you to, to miscommunicate or misunderstand what data you're actually getting, right? So um, in this case, Gregor couldn't get the same map produced um, based on um, the data that, that, that was publicly available. Uh, and the data that the Guardian used. So um, the reason why he, he couldn't get that is because, well, it seemed like the Guardian had messed around with the class limits. So the way that the, gar the Guardian was uh, showing um, the states and how the, the different uh, poverty levels in the state was they would say, okay, well, if you were, you know, if you had 22% poverty, then you had, or in between 19.5 and 22% poverty, that's, that's one category, so that's the class. Um, and they had five classes. Uh, if you look at the, the top sort of uh, chart, uh, little bar line, um, the lowest poverty rate in any state is 6.6, .6, and the highest is 22.7. So if you actually just split that range into five classes, those are the intervals that you should have, right? Well, it turns out that the Guardian actually changed how those intervals took place. I, I don't know whether they did it intentionally or not, but if you look at the, the class limits that they used, and it might have been just a consequence of the tool that they were using. Uh, perhaps they couldn't take decimals or something. I don't know. Um, they had 6% being the beginning, right? And then towards the end, you'll notice they had 18 to 23. So they were actually expanding the last class, which showed the most poverty. Um, and that resulted in this graph. But if you took a look at using the actual class limits by, uh, not the actual class limit, but by using a class limits that were defined more equally distanced from each other, you'll actually end up with a very different map, and that's the map right on top over there. So it seems to show uh, a very similar uh, thing towards um, this, one, this map, where poverty seems to be more concentrated towards the Mexican border. But in fact, you'll notice that it's less intense as it was before, simply by changing the colors, uh, simply by changing the class limits. And now the other thing that you also want to do is like not to mess around with the color choices that you do. Um, you don't want to have these extreme colors because the color choices that they had, uh, you can't see very well on the projector, but it was a lot more extreme. So the first sort of color that they chose was very, very, very different from the, the last color. So it showed for a human eye a more dramatic effect than actually there, there was. So if you choose a color that sort of uses um, uh, the lightness variables and, to, and the hues to actually create a more sort of similar color pattern, color, color palette, um, you'll notice that the, the, the map that Gregor made, it's, it shows, shows you that it's not as intense as the map that was done by the Guardian. And there's tools to actually create these color palettes. Uh, Chroma.js is one of them. 
that was actually written by Gregor. It's open source and you can check it out. Um, he also uses another col of color palette that's a little bit more uh, distinct, like defined, where the, the changes is a little bit more obvious, and that's the map on the bottom right there. So you can see there's a huge difference uh, in, the in the information that's being uh, uh, communicated through the visualization. And it's not as clear on the projector as it is on my screen. So I'll show these slides afterwards and you can take, it out and take a look at it. Now, of course, the other thing that you have to think about when you're placing all this data in context, you know, perhaps that splitting the data into five pieces might have been, you know, not, not that great. What happens when you change it and split, say, instead into two? So you notice the GIF on the first uh, on the on the right. Um, for some reason, it wasn't working when I was actually making my presentation, but now that it is working, uh, if you take a look at that first image, you'll see as the number of classes get changed, you have a uh, very different like representation of the data. So if you had um, only two classes in the beginning, you would have seen there was a big split between which which states were poor and which states well had more poverty and which states didn't have as much poverty. Um, so context is extremely important, and you can use it to get more information and also to lose information. Now, if you're wondering how do I do this with D3, well, mapping is a very interesting uh, subtopic of any data visualization. And uh, the nice thing is that D3 actually includes routines for handling geographic information. And typically, geographic information is stored in files called GeoJSON because everybody loves the web, and it, JSON is much more easier to use than uh, some of the more traditional uh, GIS file formats that were out there, like shape files and all that stuff. Now, it's fairly complicated to actually take primary source map information and convert it to GeoJSON. There's a bunch of different steps that you have to do. So if you're actually wanting to use GeoJSON, um, there's this GitHub user, Johan, whose full name I do not remember, uh, who created this um, a repository called world.geo.json. So if you wanted to get actual GeoJSON files for your D3 mappings, and I'll show you how to do at least a very simple D3 mapping as well today with real code, um, that's a repository that you can use. Now, what's interesting is that there's a new, newer format that is a, an extension to GeoJSON that's called TopoJSON. Uh, and the biggest difference between that and GeoJSON is that um, topo, like a topography essentially means that, uh, let's say that you had two bordering states, right? So GeoJSON would describe the straight as the shape that it is, this geometric sa shape, right? So if you had two states that were right next to each other, or like, um, I don't know, like two boxes next to each other, right? Th that um, intersection was stored twice, one for one state, one for the other state. With topology, though, instead you'd only store that side once. And it's just a different way to lay out the, the world and the, the boundaries that you had in your, in your map. So it actually ends up with smaller data files. And um, there are a few great um, uh, files that you could use that are top of JSON. Um, among them is World Atlas and US Atlas. You'll notice that World Atlas is much bigger, obviously, because it contains the whole world. But at the same time, it actually doesn't contain as much interesting information as uh, the US Atlas, which contains things like, oh, where are all the railroads? Where are all the highways? Where are all the little districts? Stuff like that. Uh, so let, let me show you some code. I'm going to show you how to map things with D3, and you'll see how simple it is, and you'll be able to actually do this for your own visualizations as well. I'm going to switch away from my presentation, and I'm going to jump to Visual Studio. Uh, so you should be able to see it right there. Awesome. OK. So my mouse is there. So here, this is just a simple uh, demo. And essentially, if we just take a look at this, it looks like, OK, we've got D3. We got this uh, JSON file, uh, this uh, JavaScript uh, library called TopoJSON. Uh, and the reason why it's separated from D3 is because at the moment, um, the folks are still working with it. Um, they're still developing it, so it's not part of the main D3 library yet. But uh, in theory, in the end, it will be. Um, so we got some width, some height. We're creating some color scale that's uh, logarithmic that goes from brown to steel blue, so from red to blue. Um, we're going to create some geographical path, call it path. And uh, we're going to create some uh, another SVG that will actually contain all this uh, visualization. 
Um, so I'm assuming most of you have at least played it at least once with D3, right? So this seems all very familiar to you. Where it gets really interesting, though, is this part right here. We go d3.json, okay, load this us.json file. So what's in here is actually um, the topography of the United States. So if I open up this JSON file, okay, um, it's minified because it's huge. Uh, <laughs> What, what I'll do is I'll just unminify it. It'll take a few seconds because it's huge. Okay, so you'll notice that there's different objects inside the, the JSON file. You've got um, counties, uh, which have their own little geometries. So if I close this up, you'll see you've got states as well. But, and you can see the line numbers are going huge and crazy. Um, you got land as well, and, and land is actually, in this case, the country. So, there we go. And I think that's pretty much it. Uh, here is arcs, that's how the um, topo JSON shows the things that are very common. It's the, the way that it formats its data, um, so that you don't have um, duplicate information and you end up with smaller files. So pretty cool. Uh, I like Visual Studio, by the way. It's pretty awesome <laughs> for simple things like being able to just unminify a file right away. So if we take a look at this JSON, there's all this information that's in there. Now, if I actually want to use it, um, I can use some of the functions in topo JSON. Uh, and among them, let's say that I wanted to draw all the counties out there. Well, then I can select all of the counties, get that data, and then for every single county, uh, fill this, uh, basically apply this styling. And I can do the same thing for states as well. So if I actually run this and show you what it looks like, and it's on the wrong window, this is what it looks like. So all the states um, are uh, drawn with this sort of like white background, uh, sorry, white um, uh, white line, sorry? Outline, outline yes, outline. <laughs> English, I don't know, sometimes it's not my strongest uh, thing. Um, I'm from Montreal, by the way, so I also speak French, so if there's any native French speakers in here, I'd love to talk to you afterwards in French too. Uh, and, <laughs> and you'll notice that, okay, well, what we actually did in the code base is we said, Depending on how big the county is, so depending on how much you want to fill, all right, take the area of this path that is described by uh, this specific county, so the, the, the border, and um, calculate its area. And then from there, figure out where you, what, like what, uh, how heavy between uh, brown and steel blue you're going to actually draw this, um, this fill. So if I go back, you'll notice, okay, the bigger counties like in, uh, I'm not a very good, uh, I'm not an American, so I don't know which state this is. Nevada? No, I think that's Nevada. That's Arizona. Okay, Arizona. Thank you for the American. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you'll notice that in Arizona, there's a few counties that are huge, and that's probably because they're not very populated. Um, the, in essence, th it's drawn with more of the blue than some of the other smaller counties that are drawn more intensely with red. So looking back at the code, this was extremely simple. So you can imagine that, well, what if I wanted to just show um, maybe the US topology, the code would not be much more complicated than that. And if I open up a little demo here, you'll notice, okay, well, it's pretty much the same thing. I've got my topology showing uh, the land, okay? So I'm using the land object, counties and state. All right, and in this case, it's the code is extremely simple. All I'm doing is just applying a class to what I'm going to draw, this, this path that I'm going to draw. And this class, uh, if I go look at the styling, just seems to have a stroke, a, another stroke, like a more thicker stroke, and a different color. So if I run this as well, that's what it gives you. So the, the, the different color was, there was a different color for the, la uh, for the land, all right? And there was a lighter color for uh, the county itself. And the path that had um, the, um, 
sort of a thicker but same color, so the, th uh, the, th the thicker stroke but the same color, you can see that it's actually thicker as well. Now obviously the order that you draw these things will matter. So if I drew like um, the states before the counties, in theory the colors will be lighter because the counties will, over, will draw over the, sta the, the state lines uh, because they're sharing the same paths. Right? So the order matters, but at the same time, like, this is how you could draw very um, basic maps of the United States that you can then use to actually do more interesting things if you cared about counties. Um, in the US Atlas, there's also things like highways. So you can map all the highways and see how that affects different data that you have. But with D3, it's extremely simple to do this type of um, context changes, placing uh, the data in different contexts like maps or not maps, depending on uh, whether you're going to lose or gain information um, or knowledge from there. So the, the context in which data is visually placed sort of impacts that knowledge. Um, and you've got to enforce the right comparisons as well. So Make sure you're doing the right comparisons to be able to actually get information uh, for the context. And then don't forget that many problems are actually multivariate. So there's multiple variables that could impact uh, why that data is the way it is. Um, the second principle that I will talk about is um, that visualizations should match the data. Like they must, they must match the data story. Now that sounds really obvious, right? Like, I mean, of course, right? But Actually, I can just have easily renamed this principle as anti-principle one, how to use data visualization to mask, cheat, and lie. So, because <laughs> I know that's what some of you are thinking. <laughs> um, so it's fairly obvious, it's a fairly obvious point, but most people miss this because, uh, well, they're just trying to make things pretty or surprisingly, they're trying to cheat, lie, or mask things. Um, so there's a great article by uh, Ravi Parikh who's, um, Basically, it says how to lie with data visualization. So if you wanted to fool your boss and to think just thinking that things are going well or not too bad or something, um, here's an example of what you could do. You can truncate your y-axis, for example. Uh, this is basically the same data but different y-axis. In one, uh, one case, the y-axis is a lot more detailed than the other one. Um, and it shows you that the rates are incre increasing. So if you wanted to create this, um, this uh, panicked mood with whatever news agency that you work for, you can be like, hey, oh my god, the rates are going so high just by changing the scale and then maybe even hiding the y-axis values. If you are really trying to cheat or lie or deceive. Um, but in fact, like if you look at another y-axis, you'll see like, okay, well, well, maybe it's, it's not, like depending on the context that we're in, right? So. Do we care that it's 1% um, or do we care that it's 0.01% difference, right? So it really depends on the context, but here's examples of how you can cheat, right? Um, the other thing that you could do is, um, this is really common, uh, just use the cumulative function. Um, let's say that you wanted to show revenue. Well, hey, if you just changed it to cumulative revenue, it seems like things are going well, <laughs> right? But in fact, your annual revenue is in decline. Um, this one actually ended up in a court case. Uh, so this is from um, modern visual evidence. And it was discovered in Visual Explanations by Edward Tufte, one of his books. That's where I found it. And essentially, it just basically shows this company that had uh, the first graph was its quarterly revenue. right? OK, it seems to be cyclical. Um, the second graph was uh, when they just changed the time span to be the fiscal year. So it seems like things aren't that bad, but actually this, this point in 1982 was the reason for the lawsuit, right? But what the company actually ended up communicating was the same data, the same data, just in calendar years. So all the way at the, um, I guess for you that's the uh, right, uh, which showed that there's no decline at all and that things are going well. And that was actually a case for a lawsuit uh, because they were miscommunicating information to their shareholders, which is really bad. <laughs> if, you, if you know anything about um, shareholder rules and stuff like that. Uh, so let me demo a really cool tool that can actually help you define these boundaries and stuff like that. It's called CrossFilter. 
it's really made for you to, uh, to, to help you explore these large multiple variable data sets. And um, it's really a great library. I think this is probably the last demo that I'll do because I seem to be running out of time. But uh, it is pretty cool, so I do want to show it to you. So back here. Okay, it's, uh, this is straight from their website, actually. Uh, I'm not going to show you the code because it's a little bit uh, long, but this is essentially what it does. Assuming I could scroll down. There we go. So here's a tool that will help you explore the time series. Just be careful not to mess around with this because let's say that you just decided to change things to show that your average delay, and this is a flight time, by the way. Um, like, you could change this stuff so that you get a better delay, and therefore it's, it seems to show that your company is doing better on flying on time when in fact you're just lying to people. So. But it's a great tool that will help you sort of explore this data set. Uh, and it works with multiple variables and it's super great. And it works with D3 as well. Super, it's super, basically. Okay. Uh, so the knowledge communicated through your visualization must actually show the underlying data. That's a principle that you should follow. Um, and to do that, just follow convention in how you should model your data and your accesses if you're doing things that are more graph-based. And of course, don't forget, the objective of data visualization is to communicate information to the viewer. Okay, that's one of the object objectives. Uh, misleading by deception or confusion, even accidentally, will not serve your purpose. So don't do it. Uh, I guess principle three, I would say, is you can escape flatland. Um, although all the devices that we use are two-dimensional, you can actually use three dimensions to show things like um, skyline changes. So as opposed to showing the average change of the height of buildings in New York, you can actually map that in 3D. So if I run my demo, here's a way that you can see how the skyline is actually changing as opposed to showing things um, just on your map, on like a graph. Uh, this is really famous. It's visualizing friendships from an intern at Facebook. Uh, it's, it's also three-dimensional, like you, the lines will uh, go above, just to show you sort of yeah, an idea of how um, connections are made on Facebook. Of course, when you're talking about geographic information at a global scale, it absolutely makes perfect sense to put it on an actual globe. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about earthquakes, right? Uh, earthquakes are big, and they impact huge parts of the globe. It makes complete sense to put them on an actual globe to show you the huge amount of um, scale that earthquakes have. Now, of course, using three dimensions incorrectly adds no value and will obfuscate what you're actually trying to show. Uh, this is a case of the ebb and flow of movies um, where they tried to have a three dimensional approach, but all it did was just really like badly show. Uh, you know, the differences between some of the movie tickets, like some of the uh, uh, movie uh, successes, right? So I know this, uh, this, this was meant to be interactive, but at the same time, just looking at it makes, gives me like more confusing details than anything else. So uh, 3D, use it carefully. Uh, and for the love of anything cool in data visualization, please do not like create bar graphs that are three-dimensional because they provide zero additional information. Please don't. I know you'll be tempted because it is part of the suites of the different office toolkits, but don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, here's an, ex an, an example of where, yeah, this is cool. It's made with D3, but at the same time, like um, showing the entire temperature history for a year for the last like 50 years behind the one that's currently on there is more annoying than it is actually providing any value because you can't read what's behind, uh, and it just makes it really difficult to read what's the, like, the year that you're actually looking at. So. Uh, uh, principle four, show your work. Um, this one basically means you can sometimes gain information just by aggregating all the data that you have onto one uh, giant map. So here's an example. This is um, 
Trulia's trends, it shows when people are looking at houses. Uh, so you'll notice that they have the entire week and all the hours. So <laughs> it's actually more useful um, looking at it this way than if they just showed you a graph per day, like how many people were on their sites for that specific day. Right? So they, they actually minimized uh, the data by using colors and blocks. Okay? I'm not, not showing actual numbers, but you actually got a lot more information that was easier to read, easier to understand than if they put numbers and graphs showing all this information that they had. And it's also really pretty. Too, so. uh, here's another one. This one is extremely useful. This one is by Mike Bostock. Um, it shows you what happens when you use different shuffling techniques. And um, essentially, uh, it's a matrix diagram that shows you what's the likelihood of a, a, a shuffling algorithm to not actually shuffle certain numbers in the, the, the matrix, in the, like, like the uh, array that you're shuffling. Um, so a good shuffling algorithm would be unbiased. Um, so it would be all gray. Uh, in this case, this one was bad because you can clearly see that some numbers had more of a positive likelihood to be like in the same place uh, versus others. So, eh, not the the best shuffling out, um, uh, not the best shuffling mechanism that you could use. But you wouldn't be able to figure that out just by looking at the probabilities of every individual point. But when you put it on a matrix, it's a lot clearer that there's something actually going on. Uh, this one is life expectancy. Um, every single line is a country. So you can see that the world as a whole is increasing. But if you click on a specific country, you'll notice that some of them are uh, more isolated, uh, like are increasing and decreasing differently. So it's interesting. Last principle. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't find a, a very clever name for this one. Uh, so it ended up being this. You can tell me if it's clever or not. Uh, insights from hay bales. So what I mean by that, and I figured I'd probably have to show a picture of what a hay bale is. Uh, this is a haystack. And when you organize them into um, bales, <laughs> uh, they become a lot cleaner and easier to navigate and a lot easier to, to maintain if you, to feed your cows and any other animals that you had that ate hay. Um, so in other words, you can get insights from hay bales by um, and what I mean by that is that you can layer data on top of each other, like, like in a hay bale, and you could parallelize all this stuff like in a hay bale. So I don't know if it was clever or not, but uh, <laughs> I'll judge by the tweets that are coming out right now. Um, so here's what you can do. So this is a case of showing the probability of you getting pregnant depending on the birth control that you use. Now, of course, if you put all this stuff on, on the same graph, it will look pretty much the same. But by parallelizing all these graphs right next to each other, you can see that there's a progression. Okay, well, some tools are better than others, and you can see how it changes, right? So this is this is the idea. Um, basically, parallelizing your data to actually gain insight, as opposed to just sticking them all on top of each other. And of course, the other idea is you can also layer things. Uh, so this is um, Cubism. It's a library from Mike Bostock again. Um, he's really prolific, <laughs> and he's awesome. Um, here is CPU usage for a whole bunch of different servers. And what's interesting is by layering all this stuff on top of each other, um, and the x-axis is actually time. So Cubism is a great library if you're doing time series uh, type visualizations. Uh, what it does here is it actually gives you insights on when activity spikes are happening. Uh, if you take a look at the stuff that I circled, that's pretty much when they were deploying new code sequentially to all the servers. So you can see the CPU use that just blew up during that time. And you can also track like, how it changes throughout the, the time. Um, let's say that you wanted to do network in and out. If you layer the data on top of each other, say by perhaps having the outbound network traffic being the, the one that goes from the top to the bottom, and then the inbound being from the one from the bottom of the, the graph to the top, uh, you can actually get crazy information about like, when things are really, really intense as well. Uh, now, let's say that you change the time series. So as opposed to showing your network traffic every 10 seconds, you, say, uh, you said every five minutes. Here you'll have a more dis like clear understanding, OK, well, the weekends are really quiet, with the exception of a few servers that for some reason had a spike this weekend. 
And uh, if you want to check out the demo, you can check it out. Um, I was going to do a case study, but it seems like I'm out of time. Uh, if you wanted to check it out, it's Nexology. They have a really, they're, a, they're an awesome startup in Montreal that's doing a lot of big social media stuff. Um, I love working with them because it's, their data is really cool. So they pretty much ingest all of Twitter um, and do crazy statistics on it, which is pretty cool. Um, now let's say you're interested in this stuff. Here are some books. Anything by Edward Tufte. Anything is not the name of the book. I'm, I just literally mean anything that's written by Edward Tufte is a great book. <laughs> um, there's another one, Knowledge, Information is Beautiful. Uh, it's written by the same author. It's two different books, so it's not Slash. It's actually two different books, but it is beautiful at the end. Um, there's also Designing News by Franchi. This is an interesting book in that uh, it's data visualization in the context of news reporting, so it's pretty interesting. Um, of course, there's a list of websites where you, the first four is where you can see things that are really cool, um, like see visualization that other people have done. Uh, there's my Bostock's blog, which is great. D3JS's gallery, Driven by Data, which is another one. If you're looking for people to follow, Edward Tufte, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, and this is taken from his Twitter uh, profile. He actually is calling himself a data scientist now, so uh, even he's grabbed onto that term as well, even though he's been doing this for 33 years. So it's pretty, uh, um, it, it seems to be well understood what the term actually means. Uh, Mike Bostock, Jonathan Corum, he's doing some really great stuff. Brett Victor, uh, he's really famous for having done some really awesome design work at Apple and at other companies in, in public and at different talks. Um, and Gregor Esch, he's really great as well. He actually wrote Cartograph.js, um, which is a great um, library to do um, mapping type uh, visualizations. So what did you learn? A little bit of an introduction to data visualization in case you were confused about how it fit into the world right now, like how it impacts, um, where it fits within this whole spectrum of big data stuff that's happening. Uh, so those are the five data visualization principles that I use before um, actually just jumping into D3, so the things that I think about with my data and then taking a look at the libraries that I will actually end up using to make this uh, insights come out. Um, so the five principles, context is king, uh, visualizations must match the data, stop trying to cheat and lie. Uh, escape flatland, um, escaping flatland can be very useful. Aggregating details can reveal knowledge, so putting all the, the data points that you have on one visualization can be very, very helpful as well as layering and parallelizing these uh, visualizations. So thank you very much. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, if not, uh, you can send me a tweet as well. Thank you.